Danny, hey, congratulations for your documentary, King of North Sudan. Thanks so much, Gig. And thanks so much for talking with us. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. We're, we're excited about this. Yeah, obviously it's being showcased at the Austin Film Festival this year. How, how do you guys feel about that? I mean, super. We're really excited. I mean, I just I just got to Austin um, two hours ago and Brett gets here tomorrow. And I think it's going to be in a lot of ways like the perfect audience for the film because there's like, I think going to be a really kind of interesting crowd in the theaters. And I think like there's going to be, you know, a nice split between people that are on, you know, Team Jeremiah, the protagonist of the film and people that are against him. So I think that will that will play out in interesting ways in the uh, in the screenings. Yeah, there's obviously an amazing uh, film community and um, and Austin. So we're like super excited to have to be able to like, yeah, have our peers see it as well. And um, and there's some connection from some of the EPs on our film to Austin. So it's like feels a little bit like a homecoming in some ways. So, yeah, we're super excited. <laughs> Well, that's great to hear. I mean, the, the the story is a fascinating story. I think I remember briefly seeing something like this on the news about a girl becoming a princess of an African nation. And then I just went ahead and dismissed it as like a tabloid uh, gossip or something. When did you guys hear about it? Um, I first came across Jeremiah in 2016. So I actually like I miss the thing actually happening. You know, he, uh, for those that don't know the story, Jeremiah Heaton is a white guy from Appalachia, from Southwest Virginia, who found a piece of land in between Egypt and Sudan called Birtuil. And it is, you know, because of um, the history of uh, colonialism, really, frankly, it is the only piece of land in the world that isn't claimed by anyone. And he went there and planted a flag and declared himself king and his daughter a princess. Um, which, as you said, is sort of just like a charming, weird, problematic uh, kind of tabloid story. And, um, you know, his story, that's really like the first 15 minutes of the film and it kind of goes from there. So, so when did you guys decide to make this into a documentary and follow his life? So I think this, you know, this started, as I said, in 2016, and I had read a, you know, like a two paragraph long article, like I think it was like a Vice article or something about a convention of the founders of Micronations that was taking place in LA. And my first impulse was obviously like, what is a Micronation? And who are these, who are these crazy people? And, you know, a micronation is basically a, a country that started by like a, a, one, a single person or a small group of people. And, you know, they almost never have recognition from the country as surrounding them. And, you know, it was the 2016 election and everyone was sort of at this place of kind of peak, um, you know, kind of uh, election fatigue and sort of exhaustion of sort of you know, the functioning of government. And I think for a lot of people, myself included, there was a lot of thinking about, you know, what would things look like if we just started from scratch? Like, what would things, what would things look like if we just started, if we just started over? So I, um, so I thought it might be interesting to speak with these uh, micronation founders and kind of, you know, talk to them about their stories and kind of their ideas for kind of utopian societies. And, you know, one of those people was Jeremiah. And, you know, his story was just so much more interesting than everybody else's. It kind of became clear immediately that he kind of had what it took to anchor a whole film. So you guys reached out to uh, Jeremiah. Was it easy to convince him to be a part of this film? <laughs> I mean, the short answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was very easy. I mean, I like, my expectation was that, um, you know, I just wrote the like info at Kingdom of North Sudan, you know, uh, email address that I found. And, you know, my expectation would be that I was going to have to, you know, it was going to be this whole long, months long process of trying to track him down. And literally we have a cat. <laughs> we, uh, 
we uh and basically he wrote me back within five minutes and we were like on the phone and our first conversation i think lasted for four hours and i pretty much talked to him every day for the next like year you know four years so what were your your, your guys uh, first impressions of jeremiah i mean i guess uh, everyone would have a certain first impression because he's he's quite a character in my opinion yeah, Brett, do you want to say what your first impression was from kind of like watching that first footage? Yeah, so I mean, um, it's interestingly, like as the kind of producer of the film and like having worked a lot on it, um, I've actually never met Jeremiah. I didn't go on any of the shoots just because, um, you know, we were self-financing and uh, while I wanted to be there, it just didn't make financial sense for like me to travel to Thailand or to some of the other places that we went for the film. So. Um, I'll be meeting him for the first time at the premiere uh, on Sunday. So that's, um, but, um, you know, I think my, I've spent, without having met him, I've spent a lot of time with him and particularly in the edit room. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think that like, what kind of jumps out to you is both just, um, he's very captivating. Um, he's an extreme, like he has definitely has a uh, silver tongue. He's very, he's got the gift of gab. He's like an amazing talker. Um, and so, I mean, I think he's also, for me, still remains kind of like a confounding and befuddling person because I think a lot of conflicting things about him because I'm both charmed by him and entertained by him and then um, impressed with some of the things that he's done and then also find some of them uh, pretty scary or or you know, mm-hmm. objections to them um so yeah he's uh from a filmmaking perspective he's a great like you know you would love to see somebody like him in a in a fictional piece and let alone in, in real life um yeah and i guess i guess for me like you know he's a person that is always on right so he's sort of like you know, he is sort of like what you think of as a politician. And he, he actually ran for Congress uh, in his community and he obviously didn't get it. Um, but he, you know, so like, you know, you, you, you meet him and he immediately starts talking and he's very good at, you know, kind of, kind of saying what he thinks you want to hear and kind of, you know, weaving a really good yarn. But I think the thing that is interesting about him is that, you know, with time, he is willing to kind of open up. And I think it's like, what was interesting was was kind of, you know, the amount of time that it took to kind of build that trust with him, to kind of get him to, you know, kind of say how he was really feeling about stuff. And also, you know, also a lot of that is kind of shown, right? And just the fact that he kind of let us be in the room for a lot of these things that were, I think, pretty vulnerable for him. Daniel, did you uh, hang out with him a bit? Uh, I'm, I, I wasn't quite sure if you hung out with him like uh, at restaurants or like on the boats in Thailand or something. I mean, like, you know, we didn't have any prior relationship to the film. So obviously when I was hanging out with him, it was, you know, I was there to shoot and I was there to work. Obviously, like, uh, you know, we saw, you know, we filmed him as you see in the film and lots of sort of, you know, like, you know, it's, it's a film about him, right? So it's like him, just seeing him be himself in a variety of different scenarios is interesting. There's like him in all of these crazy meetings, but also, as you said, uh, hi, Kat, as, as you said, seeing him, you know, like, for instance, on the boat when he was, you know, just really kind of comfortable and having fun was also just like a really interesting side of him. And like, you know, through the filming, it's like, even if you're filming 12 hours a day, if you're in Thailand with him, you know, there's a lot of hours of the day that you're just kind of hanging out and not filming. So I've definitely spent a huge amount of time with him at this point. Brad, I guess uh, this question is more for you. Logistically, was this a difficult project? Because this, uh, usually documentaries have to keep uh, on a tight budget, but you you guys have to travel around the world or something like this. (laughs) Yeah, no, I mean, it definitely was. And I think like, I, you know, kind of say that like the producer and line producer with me were sort of constantly fighting because I, as the producer, I was like, I want to go like, I want to go to Thailand and shoot with these guys. And the line producer was like, we don't have the money for that. Um, So yeah, I think we had to be pretty creative. We had to pick our spots. You know, we got some initial sort of seed funding to do the um, 
to do basically a sizzle, but it didn't really take us that far. And then, um, you know, we basically, one thing that we've talked about throughout this process, which is kind of ironic, is a lot of the movie is about Jeremiah trying to find the next dollar that he needs to keep on this crazy journey. And that's kind of how we felt. We were just like, you know, mm. how do I like, get this next shoot done? And, um, you know, we just uh, end up being pretty strategic. And, um, you know, sometimes we were able to actually travel, like, you know, Danny and, and our cinematographer, Ben McIntyre, were able to go to Thailand. Um, one of the, two of the times that he was there. Um, but, you know, also in the film, he goes to China um, and we couldn't afford for anybody to go there. So we hired a local uh, director of photography. Um, you know, we rely on some Skype and Zoom interviews before those were so much a part of our daily life. Um, and yeah, we just tried to maximize the, the limited resources that we had and, um, you know, use all of our airline miles and all that big borrow and steal to kind of get the next thing that we needed. And, um, and yeah, but, but it was definitely, definitely a challenge. I don't recommend trying to make a <laughs> documentary that takes place all around the world. Uh, that is on a shoestring budget. Yeah. That, yeah that was, that was yeah. not easy. So, so did you, did you guys, uh, use, reuse the footage for Beard to Well, or did you guys actually travel there, uh, to get, get some footage? So it's, it's basically a recreation. I mean, we hired a cinematographer in, uh, in Egypt. And, you know, it's like, this is how all these things work. It's like, we were like, okay, we want him to like, you know, first it was like, okay, we're going to go to Beer Twill. And then it was like, okay, like we don't have the money to go to Beer Twill. We're going to send someone from Cairo to Beer Twill. And then we narrowed it even further that, because it was just really, it was prohibitively expensive to send him there. So we sent him you know, basically like four hours outside of Cairo. And that's, and that's what all that footage is. Yeah, and just kind of gave him a list of, uh, of stuff that we needed to sort of recreate that trip um, a little bit because, yeah, I think another sort of storytelling challenge for us was that because we started filming with Jeremiah in 2016, it was a few years after um, he had gone. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of sort of setup that needs to happen for the rest of the film and we, wanted that stuff to feel very immediate because um, the rest of the film is a lot of verite and a lot of uh, stuff that we were obviously there for. Um, and so that was one of the ways we tried to check that box of kind of making it, making sure it felt like um, exciting and like we, you know, that you were sort of there even though we were recreating it after the fact. So with the, with the Thailand footage, you had to rely on his footage, his camera. Was, was that a, difficult thing um were you guys afraid he might got caught or or was it like difficulty more on the editing side i mean i i think that that was probably the most that that was the most stressed out i think i've ever been in my entire life i think that week you know basically jeremiah the uh the masterful talker that he is was like i'm going to thailand for this thing you should come with me and we arrive in Virginia to film with him and we were going to fly there with him. And he says, oh, by the way, I haven't told them yet that you're coming. <laughs> so we we're just like, oh, my God. OK. And, you know, we had given him this camera earlier in the year because uh, I think it's just like a really, you know, especially for someone like him who loves to be on camera. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting to give a person a camera and see what they film. You know, it's like, what do they find interesting? And like, generally the director, like, you know, like will find it interesting in a different way than they do. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, we had already given him this camera and, you know, it was his idea. You know, I think he kind of wanted to make everybody happy. And he said, look, he was like, I don't feel comfortable telling them you're here, but if you want, I will bring this camera into the meetings. And, you know, to be totally honest, we did not, you know, we knew that these guys were potentially unsavory, but we actually did not realize kind of the extent to which they were unsavory until much, much later. And I think like, and I think had we known, I think we would have had to say like, Jeremiah, like, we don't feel comfortable, like, we're not gonna, we don't want to be a part of this. <laughs> like, this is, this is like too scary. And, you know, we're not gonna, I'm not gonna give anything away uh, in the film, you know, from the film, but just, you know, 
one of the people like we kind of we were learning about this in real time but like one of these people who he was trying to raise money from was like missing fingers and you know it it quickly it quickly comes out that these people he's dealing with are not nice and they're not uh on the level with what they're telling him they want to do and it was it was pretty scary <laughs> it was pretty scary yeah i think to your point danny like yeah, i think we uh like it's it's hard to in retrospect remember back because yeah we really didn't like the reason he didn't want to film didn't want to let it, let them know that that the crew was there that you were there with him was because he didn't want to like he was afraid it was going to like mess up the deal basically that he was like going to put the the money he was hoping to raise at um at risk um and we didn't yeah we didn't really realize the kind of people that he was getting in bed with and <laughs> the the potential danger that he was putting himself in by bringing a hidden camera into those meetings until later yeah honestly like until until like months and months later like when the the story progressed even farther and we like you know we watched all that footage and you know you see in the film it's like it's really tense it's like extremely extremely tense and i don't think we totally i didn't totally realize how contentious those meetings were until i until i looked at the footage <laughs> well i i guess it's also a good 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 luck on you you guys that you guys didn't get too too knee deep involved or you know what? I don't know. I don't even know how uh, film funding actually works. You guys be you guys could be negotiating with the Chinese or Thai investors for all I know. <laughs> <laughs> that that would be a good idea. Yeah, we should have just gone to the same people to get money. Yeah, or just be like, we won't put this movie out and if uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> reverse financing. Um, but yeah, it's definitely yeah. I think we were pretty. It, yeah, basically, like what you were saying, Danny, it was, uh, it was several months before we kind of had a full, and even now don't have, I think, of the fullest understanding of, we know enough to know that these folks are, uh, we're up to no good, but, um, and we're not the kind of people that you should be bringing hidden cameras into meetings with, but um, I don't think we still know exactly what their angle or backstory is. That's true. So after uh, spending uh, years on on this project, did you guys did you guys have a conclusion about uh, Jeremiah? Do you think he's sane or insane or a genius? I mean, he's definitely a little bit of both. I mean, he's not insane. He's he's definitely not insane, or he is insane in the same way that I think you know successful entrepreneurs and politicians are insane. So I think like yes, insane but i think not more so than people that are doing you know on paper anyways less insane things but i think that you know i i think the thing that the that we try to bring up with the film and that we want people to kind of debate after the film you know is like is what jeremiah is doing like you know should he be considered a hero or a villain you know like I don't think he's insane, but is he a hero and a, or a villain? Like, I think that's that's open for debate. And I I say that as someone who, you know, I I feel close with him at this point, and I I you know, and we're friends. And I think that you know, I I think the jury is definitely out. And I think that depending on your background and you know your opinions on a lot of different things, I think that will really shade the way that you watch the film. And that and that's our intention. That sounds great, Bob. Has has Jeremiah checked out the film already? He he sure has, and he he loves it. I mean, he he loves it. I mean, obviously, he's a guy that really likes seeing himself on camera. But I think that he also, yeah, I think he, I, I you know, and I, I honestly, I think this is, you know, this is the greatest compliment that we could have gotten. But I think him and his family, I think they feel like we we told the truth, and even when we weren't. You know, you, you know, in the film, as you as you know from watching it, it's not always flattering towards that. But I think that he, I think he feels like we got it right. And I think with you know, when you're making a film about a real person, I think that that's really, really, you know, that feels really important as a filmmaker. Yeah, and there, yeah, like Jane was saying, there's parts that are really hypercritical of Jeremiah, um, and you know, I think 
just really kind of show our perspective on some of the politics of what uh, he did. And um, yeah, I think he like from, from everything you've told me, Danny, I think he feels like we at least gave him an even hand and didn't misrepresent his position. Um, and so, you know, there's no sort of gotcha element to it. Um, and we're not, um, you know, we're just sort of presenting his viewpoint and, and, you know, your, I think your viewpoint as the director, Danny, definitely comes through as well. And, um, but it's not, yeah, not so like villainizing. It just kind of lets it be what it is. Um, but yeah, there's also like, he, there's sort of a Three Stooges element to some of it too. There's there's like a little bit of slapstick comedy and I saw he post like reposted one of the stills from the movie and was like talking about himself being like a bumbling guy. So I think he's also pretty self-aware. Like, I, think, I, I think he described himself in his Instagram post as a uh, as a bumbling international Mr. Bean. Yes, he did. Which I think is not, I think that's not so bad, but I think it's a pretty good, I think that's a pretty good take. I know. I, I I I do have to admit I was laughing at some uh, some of the ideas on what to do with that uh, li little region itself, but uh, but I don't want to spoil too much of the movie because pe people should watch it itself to just to just get a sense of the idea. I'm curious what's what it, what is your takeaway about Jeremiah after watching it? Um, quite quite honestly, um, I I've, I've seen um, people like this. They're 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 just basically like dreamers, but it's also the uh, it's also the idea of, uh, you know, people who have like, you know, far-fetched ideas and then it's either you like them or you don't. But, you know, that's that's what we said about, uh, you know, like uh, like Tesla and, uh, you know, SpaceX. It's, it's not new ideas. If you really think about it, you know, people came up with these same ideas before. I'm certain I'm my personal feeling is that I'm certain people try to claim this land before they just can't go anywhere. It's not like it's the first time that uh, we're going to go out into space or come up with the electric car. It's just a right. question of who's who's actually going to do it. So to me and in Jeremiah, his, his ideas aren't crazy. It's just uh, I just want to say the process is is the challenge <laughs> of it, and and it's just a question of who who does it first. As far as I'm concerned, you know, Trump Trump could buy this property and declare himself king. Kingdom North Sudan. Yeah, he <laughs> yeah. could. Might I try. think people would probably react as well to him as they do to Jeremiah, which is extremely polarized. Yeah, and then and that's and that's how I how I feel about it. But uh, but but your uh, the, the film raises a lot of great questions, and uh, you know, if I think it portrays him um, in uh, in a certain light that uh, that's very debatable in, in its own way. Absolutely. So af after Austin, are there more chances for other audiences to view this documentary? Well, yeah, that's that's certainly the plan. Um, you know, we really just finished, we just finished the movie like weeks ago. So we are like right at the very beginning of this process. And, you know, we premiered it at the Vancouver International Film Festival. And, you know, Austin is now uh, the next one. And, you know, we we were so lucky to uh, team up with uh, Rough House Pictures, which is Danny McBride and David Gordon Green's company. So they basically came on as executive producers, which has been a real godsend. So kind of with this extra firepower, the plan is hopefully in the next couple months, you know, we're talking to distributors. So hopefully, 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 uh, you know, within the next year, people will be able to see it uh, on platforms everywhere. That is terrific to hear. Well, hey, gentlemen, congratulations once again for your documentary, King Thanks. of uh, North Saddam. I, I think it was a mesmerizing character, to say the least, that uh, that we we get to watch. And if you need distribution, I guess you could always ask Jeremiah to raise the funds for you guys. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Well, thank <laughs> Hey, yeah, thanks so much again, Gig. And, you know, for everyone watching, please come see the movie. It's screening uh, on Sunday at 8 p.m. with the Austin Film Festival. And then again on Wednesday, uh, I believe at 5 p.m., Brett. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. And then also there, it's virtually available to you through the film festival if you're not in Austin. Most yeah. excellent. Well, hopefully um, you guys uh, talk to me again on your next project. This is uh, very entertaining. I've 
hopefully you find another interesting character out there. We, we, we certainly hope to. Yeah, thank you so much, Kate. This was great. Hey, thank you. Next time. Absolutely. All right.